All right, welcome everyone. Uh, this is our advanced R uh, cohort number six. Uh, today we're going to be covering chapter two, names and values. Let me share my screen and we will get that up and running as well. Stop two and share. All right, what we should be seeing for everybody is going to be a <clears throat> a presentation that our cohort two members put together. Um, this uh, person's name was Josh uh, Polkamp Hart. Um, I wanna give thanks to Josh uh, for using these slides. Um, in such a short notice, I didn't have a, an opportunity to present, or sorry, to author a full slide deck. So we're gonna be pulling from the, the past history here. This was in February of last year uh, when this particular uh, presentation was done. Um, I don't know, Frederica, if you want to post the YouTube link uh, from the cohort two's uh, presentation as a comparison, um, it's not a pro or it's not in it's not a necessity. Um, with this cohort number two, um, <clears throat> excuse me, chapter number two, um, the introduction. Uh, states uh, R is an important to understand the distinction between an object and its name. So the object is the memory space, the naming convention that we have applied to it. So the distinction between the two is important and it's, it's, it's carried throughout uh, the entire uh, portion of this chapter. Uh, doing so will more accurately predict the performance and memory usage of your code, uh, write faster code by avoiding accidental copies and major source of slow code, better understands R's functional programming tools, and then as a goal for this entire chapter two uh, is to understand that the distinction between names and values and where R will copy an object. So with this in mind, and Frederick and I were uh, conversing on Slack prior to today's presentation, um, I had a, a thought in my mind uh, concerning C and C++ and it regards linked list. Memory allocation or memory usage on today's hardware isn't such a huge problem, but it does become a factor when you're dealing with such extremely large data sets. And so being able to manipulate that, store it in memory, and then augment it, change it, modify it, et cetera, R has a tendency to do some uh, management in the background. And the topic of advanced R is obviously we want to comprehend or understand how that memory management service operates. Okay, so again, we're going to be using cohort two's presentation. All right. So our outline is the distinction between names and values. When R makes a copy and how to track them, how much memory an object actually occupies, this is going to be uh, important between your operating system and the environment of R as you're managing this information. Uh, exceptions to copy on modify and the garbage collector as a service. The prerequisites for this are the lobster package, and we'll talk about lobster, as used to understand the internal representation of our objects. So we install library lobster. When we discuss uh, binding, uh, consider the example, uh, what is exactly happening? We're creating a object and we're naming it X. We're populating content into that object with values one, two, and three. Uh, are we creating X and it has values one, two, and three? And the answer to that question is not necessarily. We are allocating memory services with a name X. We're populating that named variable, or sorry, named object with the values one, two, and three. So it's kind of, uh, uh, it actually, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> We're doing both, okay? There's a statement in the chapter, and I want to find it real quick and reiterate what we're talking about here. Um, so if you're reading this, it states, uh, we create an object named X containing the values one, two, and three. Unfortunately, this isn't, or sorry, that's a simplification that would lead to inaccurate predictions about how R is actually doing this uh, memory allocation behind the scenes. Um, yes, we're creating an object of vector values one, two, and three, and it's binding that object to the name X. In other words, the object or value doesn't have a name necessarily. It's actually the name, uh, sorry, it's actually the name that has a value. So we wanna make sure that we are very clear in that one comment. It's very imperative throughout this chapter that we make that distinction of what's going on here. Okay. We're allocating memory space and that memory space so happens to utilize the name X. Okay. 
So the next uh, uh, iteration here is it's not really, it's more, uh, it's more accurate to say that the code is this. We create an object, a vector of values one, two, and three, and we bind, we connect that to the object, which we named X. So the image that we have is showing this purple box. And if Frederica, if you want me to zoom in a little bit more, I can, since we're doing this on Chrome, if the slide deck is too small. That's okay. I don't know Okay, so, oops, excuse me, forgive me. There we go. Uh, what we see here is a purple box and it's indicated with the rounded corners, this named object called X. And then we're, we're actually uh, binding or connecting to the uh, list one, two, and three that we're applying the, the vector of values one, two, and three to that named object. And what's important here is the memory allocation table. So below this, uh, uh, below this image, you can see that it's called 0x74b. That's hex code for just 74b. But the, uh, the naming is often much longer. Uh, and we'll see this here in code examples coming up in the, the next slides. So that, that bit is a, a part of the code. It's a part this, of the ID identification of the uh, allocation in memory of this uh, object. Correct. In your current R environment, you are allocating uh, memory. And this could be, it's not usually hard drive space. It's, it's often either cached memory or RAM. You're allocating that to this object of uh, value, sorry, named object X, you're applying the values of one, two, and three, you're binding it to that object. So in essence, we have a vector of one, two, and three, these just arbitrary numbers, but the values of one, two, and three are being stored in this memory space 74B. We are binding or connecting, we are referencing that use to the object named X that we've created. So there's two things happening here. First, we're allocating the memory space. We're populating it with content. The second would be now we're connecting that to a more human readable form, this name X that we will use throughout our code. Does that make sense? Basically, we are not assigned um, this object to the X. Uh, Variable in most, has, yeah, in most x to uh, the, the variable to the object. That's correct. Yeah, in, in most cases, in our human logic, we are creating this container and we're going to populate that container with some substance, right? Um, I don't know, you're making a recipe or you're, you're, I don't know, gathering some commodity, right? We have a, a shopping cart and we're, we're in the store, you know, putting things into the shopping cart. Um, the thought process in our human logic would be, we have this container and we're putting content in the container. In essence, that's not actually accurate. What you're doing is you're uh, listing out the objects you're going to go grab. And then it just so happens to be that we're putting it into the cart um, or the, it's, the objects don't exist. We're still, uh, we're instantiating them uh, by, by giving them context. But uh, my point being is that the thought process is actually your allocating memory space with these values, and then you're just binding it, you're connecting it, you're, you're naming that space a, a, a convention that we humans apply to it. It's, it's, it's a, a distinct difference, I guess, is my point. We'll see this in, in Lobster, and there's another base package that uh, is called out in the book in reference to this as well. In fact, you can think of a name as a reference uh, to a value. For example, in the following code, we don't copy, we don't copy the vector one, two, and three. We get another binding to the existing object. So as an example, if we were to create a second named service called Y, uh, object called Y, and then we're binding it to the values of X. We can use lobster object address to see the objects identifiers. In this case, they're both the same. So if we were to call out X first, so this lobster package we're referring to, just use the function object uh, address with the, with the named value, named object X, 
sorry, I'm being careful that I'm using my terms properly. I don't want to use the word value. Uh, with the object X, we're seeing that the memory location is this 7FA0. We can see again that if we call a second request, a second function for that memory allocation of Y, it's going to be the same value. Forgive me. Sorry about that. It'll be the same value because, in essence, in memory, both of these named objects are pointing at the same memory allocation, this 7FA uh, X value. We are binding the two together. We're connecting, saying that the value, the named object Y is containing the value of X, right? But in essence, in the background, under the hood of R, the memory management of R, it's actually the same memory allocation, the vector list of one, two, and three. Okay. Frederica, I'm looking at the speed of the slides. Uh, if there's a point where any of the team wants to jump in and add their own two cents to this, uh, please feel welcome. Uh, I don't want to end up uh, too short. We have plenty of time to cover these topics. Okay. That's, that's okay. okay. Um, copy on modify. So copy on modify. How does X and Y, or how does X modify Y? What happens to X when we modify Y? So in this case, uh, what we're going to see is We've assigned uh, y uh, three, sorry, the third location, the number four. So we have one, two, and three. That's not right. I'm creating a list of three values uh, and then updating it with four. So if x has only one, two, and three. Sorry, go ahead, Frederica. I'm creating a, a list with uh, uh, assignment named object Y, and then I'm trying to update it with four. With our previous example, we had the same memory location of one, two, and three. Uh, in this case, I'm assigning the value four to that object. But when I print X, when I print X, it's one, um, this number one is important and I can't recall what that is. It's the, the vector uh, with values one, two, and three contained inside. So X didn't get modified, I guess is the point that we're trying to convey here. Changing the value of Y did not modify X, even though from the previous example, we assigned the, val uh, the values contained in the named object X to the named object Y. By updating Y, what ended up happening is we created two different memory locations. So this is due to the behavior called copy on modify. Because I modified the named object Y with the third value of four, sorry, it's one, two, three, and we're just replacing the third uh, entry uh, with four instead. What happens is it makes a copy and then reassigns it to a different memory space. And the, the important element here for the team what I'm wanting your eyes to focus on are these memory naming conventions. So X is still at that 74B location, but because we've modified the named object Y, it makes a copy of it before previously it was pointing at the same memory location. By updating it, it made a copy of it and then modified as requested. So now it's one, two, and four. So it does get a new memory space yeah but that that is different from uh, the object address uh, from, from the function in, in yeah. do you want to go back uh, a slide no no here uh, the object address function with y mm -hmm. release uh, a string no no at the bottom of the page oh sorry yeah this one that, here that's the address of the of y Okay, so oh. the, the beginning of the thing is different from, from this. So um, I didn't catch the uh, exact That might be. This, uh, short uh, code is uh, compared to the address and location memory. Uh, da, 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 da. Sorry, I'm wanting to catch maybe that exact. Meant, yeah, okay. I don't know, maybe they mentioned, but it's not uh, vital at the moment. It just that. Uh, uh, as well as you, I thought that was the beginning of the, the string. Instead, it's not. 
No, I think that's a mistake in the slide. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, the no. image comes from Hadley's book. He just gave it like a shortened uh, identifier. Um, Correct. And then the ones that you see, yeah, that you have highlighted right now, right, are the actual addresses when the slide was rendered. So they are different. Yes. So they are different. I guess it doesn't match the the image. Is that the comment? Okay. Arthur, I think you're correct. The the that, the, uh, that's a, is the, the begin is uh, zero times seven, and the, the two uh, on a side from, from the slide are the same zero times seven and five. Or, uh, no, what, what Arthur was mentioning. CD two. What Arthur was mentioning is is because this is the the uh, slide code. Uh, by making that object address, this would this is the exact memory at the time of authoring of um, the uh, the previous presenta uh, presenter's uh, memory allocation. So that doesn't matter. <laughs> no, these won't match. I guess is the yeah. What Arthur's trying to mention is these these won't match directly to the to the the image capture itself. The point, the important element here, sorry for jumping back and forth here. We can see that on the first entry of this creation, named objects X and Y point at the same list of one, two, and three, okay, or the same uh, values of one, two, and three. And when we run this lobster object address X and Y, we get the same memory. Moving forward to the, to the next slide though, by updating Y, we do a copy on modify. I'm sorry. We do a copy on modify. And then when you request that object address and memory again, we get the same value for X from the previous slide, but Y is now updated. So it made a copy of that uh, copy of those values, modified the third uh, entry of that, um, those values to change three to four and then reassigned it to a different memory location. Okay, uh, moving to step or uh, slide number eight. Uh, we can use a trace memory. This is another base function trace memory to trace uh, to track when an object gets copied. It does so by printing the address of the object every time it is copied. I found when using this trace mem that or the function it's you're turning up a kind of a debug level and then turning off the debug level. So by asking or applying the concatenation trace memory X, the named object X, um, this is just a, a uh, iterator, uh, the uh, new line as it, as it spits out. Every time we modify X, it's going to tell us what memory location it's located at. So that when we rerun the same code again, we assign the named object X to the named object Y, and then we update. And now we add just a different added line here, this 4L. Okay, now we're adding a character into this. But the point being is the process of copy on modify is creating another memory allocation for that object Y, named object Y. And then you can see the trace mem output of this location now it changes to this location. So, sorry, my mouse keeps jumping around with the slides. Sorry about that. The with visible with call it it extends off past there. But the point is that it copied a new location, modified the cell, and then gave us back the new memory allocation, new memory space uh, for that second object. If we modify Y again, we will not make another copy. That's because the new object now only has a single name bound to it, the value of Y or the named uh, object Y. So R applies a modify in place, not a modify or copy and modify um, for an optimization. All right, let me explain this a little bit further. So initially we created a memory allocation. We pointed two named objects at that same memory space. It doesn't matter what the, the variables are, the values are at the moment. Just know that we have created this location in our RAM or cache memory, and we're pointing the named values X and Y at it. The moment that we changed Y, it had to create another instance. So if we update or change Y a second, third, fourth, 10th, 15th, 100th time, 
it's not going to change that memory location because it's already been bound to that named object. And I guess that's the really distinct element here that we want to convey with this chapter, the object, sorry, the naming object and how it is managed versus the memory space of stored content for that location. And it's going to be more important here in just a couple of slides. If we modify Y again, uh, sorry. So if we take the third value of uh, the number three and we replace it with five. So um, it's not going to, it's not going to rename. There's no trace output, trace memory output because it didn't change its memory location. It's just updated that value. We can turn off the trace memory by just calling it untrace mem and then get passing the value X. Uh, untrace mem is the opposite of trace mem. Uh, it turns tracing off. So think of it as just like a, another debug level that we can watch how our resources, our memory is utilized throughout our particular script that we're writing. Um, going back to the very beginning of my first initial comment though, um, in today's current hardware and resources that we use for a lot of our computing, this thought process of memory allocation isn't as important as, as it used to be. Um, when we were dealing with, you know, very small memory space, uh, RAM, hard drives, et cetera, the allocation or the management of that is important. It, today, in today's world, we just scale into larger formats. So um, with our newer uh, data science world, data analysis world, um, our data sets are much, much, much larger. Um, so if you access something with a very large space, you may have to incur some of these uh, trace mem type thought process uh, to best allocate your hard drive. Having a supercomputer doesn't necessarily imply that it's going to be any more faster or efficient than a smaller computer. Um, copy on modified uh, dealing with lists. Now lists are a little bit different. And when we're going to compare lists and data frames together, um, this these next uh, these next images are uh, somewhat difficult to understand or comprehend what's going on. But once you start to understand the distinction between a list and a, and a uh, data frame, it's important. Data frames are just uh, lists of lists. Uh, it's not just named. Man, oh man, I'm sorry about this. Every time I move my mouse, the slides are jumping too. It's not just names that point to the values. We also have elements of lists that, that do this too. Consider that this list, which is appears similar to the vector above. So we have this named object L1, meaning list number one, and we are calling on the list function with values one, two, and three. Now, what is happening uh, this is a little bit more complex because instead of storing the values itself, it stores the references to them. So we have these different memory spaces, and then we're pointing at the values one, two, and three. So it's slightly different in it, uh, its context. Uh, Frederica, when we were having our side conversation and my reference to linked lists, this is where the topic of links, linked lists uh, become important just to share a quick story with the team so you know where I'm coming from with my uh, comment. Um, as an early student in computer science, we learned about uh, C++ and one of the um, tasks, one of the homework assignments were to manipulate memory storage using a for loop and linked list uh, format. We had to manage the memory location and then be able to un uh, disconnect that memory, tie it to another one, and then reconnect it to another variable. Um, I will be forward and just say that I did not do very well in this topic. For me, working in this ephemeral thought process, I couldn't comprehend exactly what we were doing. I could get the code down, but visualizing what I was doing, it did not make sense to me. And it's been years and years before this started to, to uh, before I started to understand what was going on. The memory allocation and the naming convention that you apply to that memory are two different things. And that's where I was missing uh, the uh, connection. So here we're creating the object L1. We're populating it with this list values of one, two, and three. Whoa, sorry, that jumped ahead way too far. 
and then we're we're pointing at those values. It's not assigning the value to the memory object. It's just pointing to the value. This is particularly important when we modify a list. So if we reassign the object named L1 to the object named L2, again, we're creating the uh, binding of those two named objects to the memory location. In this example, it's 0x1d9. And then the three spaces in there are pointing at the values 1, 2, and 3. I'm not confusing anybody, am I? Uh, that's the, uh, you know, it takes time to mm -hmm. look into it. The the relationship is the is the really uh, more. Um, I don't want to use the word difficult because some users may watch this video or or read this chapter and immediately know what what we're talking about. Um, others may have to to think about this for a while. Where I was going with this is I'm in that second category. I'm finding this a little bit more difficult because you can't you can't touch it, you can't see it, you can't feel it. So watching how you're manipulating these um, using the uh, trace mem as a as a function or using the lobster to assign or sorry to report back its location may aid in comprehension of what you're doing. When modifications are made, the, the list object and its bindings are copied, but the values pointing to the bindings are not. So what we have in this next image is the named objects L1 and the named objects L2. We're doing that copy on modify, right? So we're creating a new memory allocation for it, but the pointers to those values are the same. So our memory object 0x1d9 and the memory object 0xcd2, they're both pointing at the values of one. They're both pointing at the values of two. Only list number one maintains the value of three, whereas by running this uh, modification, we're now taking that third element that, uh, don't, don't use the word element, third allocation, and we're, we're populating it with the value of four instead. Okay. To save value addresses, there are shared across lists, use the lobster reference uh, option. And without touching the mouse, what I'm pointing or what I'm um, wanting you to focus your attention on is the bottom half of this slide where we call the lobster ref. And then we're putting in parentheses objects L1 and L2, named objects L1 and L2. What we have is this tree output of those memory allocation. And what you want to look at is the list itself has uh, user space or memory space 38A8. I'm reading the last four digits, 38A8. The double for uh, value number one is 9FC0. The value for number two is uh, 9F88. And the value for number three, sorry, yeah, value three is 9F50. Going down to the second output, we can see that it's just increments. So values, uh, Number five is a different memory location, but the values of two and three are the same as the predecessor L1, list one. The only thing that's changed, the only thing that's, that's different here is the last point uh, has been changed or, or given different memory space, uh, the 5BD0 um, as a double. Do you, are you seeing the, the connections we're making here? I won't, I'm careful not to move the mouse because I don't want it to jump slides. But we see that values two and three on this are the same as the values here. The value of the number three, the value of three, uh, the memory is different than what it is for the list number two. So copy on modify change only what is required, and then reassign it to that uh, new memory space. Now, the statement I made a moment ago said that data frames are just lists of lists. So data frames uh, are lists of vectors. So copy on modify has an important consequence. We're incurring some extra labor 
in our reassignment. What we're doing is now creating this data frame D1, uh, named object D1 data frame. We're creating two columns, uh, column X and column Y, populating the columns with one, five, and six, and then two, four, and three. So below in our image, we see that the first column of this image has one, five, and six. The second column has two, four, and three. Also note the memory allocation address are different between these two lists, these two vectors. When we incur the additional cost is when we modify only one element. Data frames, uh, excuse me, if we modify a column, only the column needs to be modified. The others will still point to their original references. Now, this is kind of mind boggling, but it does get into this rectangular format of the tidyverse, this thought process of everything just being a big square and then you know this matrix of, of values. It, each column itself is its own memory location. The values stored within that memory location were only updating uh, based on a request of named uh, play bingo, play battleship, whatever the coordinates of that cell are, uh, cell is not the right word, uh, uh, value, we're only updating that one value based on that coordinate system. Okay, But the copy on modify is important because it's going to incur some, some uh, extra detail here. When I was reading this section, I did stumble over this one line of text because I wanted to make sure I knew what it was doing. We are copying the, or we are assigning the named object D1 to the named object D2. We are modifying the object D2 uh, with the second column and then multiplying by two. So what we had previously was one, five, and six, two, four, and three. Instead, because we've modified the second column of the point, uh, we're multiplying all values by two. It now goes two times two is four, four times two is eight, three times two is six. And it is restoring or uh, pointing, or sorry, allocating new memory location and then linking to that new memory. Any thoughts? The original D1 is still pointing on its original X and Y column list, one, five, and six, two, four, and three. Because we've only modified D2, we have to reassign a new memory location for the uh, arithmetic multiplied by two, creating four, eight, and, and six into that stored memory, and then pointing the column Y of D2 to that new memory location. Ryan, one one quick question. I I, I forget yeah, uh, whether whether I saw this in the book or not. But um, first, let me say I, I completely understand what you've just said. So my okay. question is going to kind of go a little deeper, or, or alternatively, maybe in a different direction. Good. Um, you know, looking looking at this, you know, so basically we have a list of vectors, right? Mm -hmm. um, did the book mention how memory allocation is done at the level of the vectors? Uh, is it like lists? I, I know that's the next chapter, but I, I don't know if Hadley went into that when, when talking about the kind of the names and values. Yeah, and I, I want to be very, very careful when I'm using this vocabulary. I do not want to confuse anybody. I have a tendency to think one thing and then use a different term to apply it. So um, during my my presentation, if there's a if there's a point where we're like that's not right, he said something incorrectly. Feel welcome to jump in and, and correct me. Um, I take no offense at all. The differences between vector and lists are important. You're correct. Uh, a vector is just a sequential or or a uh, a uh, it's it's the word list is why I'm having difficult uh, in in defining the vector concept. We are a sequence of numbers. Uh, they may not be sequential. So just a, a, a list or a grouping of numbers, we'll call it that. Um, whereas a list is now we're allocating the uh, bit rate to those uh, wow. values themselves. So when, when we look at data frames as lists of lists or vector uh, list of vectors, the management of that memory space in your CPU, sorry, in your cache memory or in your RAM while this code is running is 
what incurred cost do I think about when I uh, change a, a value? Um, what the reference they're making, and I'm hoping I'm answering your question. There's a reference that talks about the stored data sets in our packages. Um, we've had a, recently a conversation, side conversation outside this book club, but it has to do with how to um, manage those data sets. So the question to the to the user that's asking it, I'm telling them that there's multiple ways that you can store memory or multiple ways that you can access data. If it's a database, if it's you know a, a CSV file, XML file, uh, Excel file, JSON data, whatever the whatever the form is, as you're incurring that, as you're ingesting it, as you're you're storing it local to your machine so that you can manipulate it very optimally. If you if you change anything, just remember it's it may uh, create a very, very costly process. We're going to talk about for loops and then possibly per as a, a, a secondary to that. The management of memory inside of R has a tendency to create copies of themselves. And the topic that I'm, I'm conveying to the, to the group here is the differences between any of our data frame manipulation formats versus possibly using data table, or there's a third one, and I can't remember what it is, but it has to do, it's a it's an open source um, storage location, uh, storage management format. Um, it, it has to do with like uh, text files, but it's not it's not necessarily text files. And if I, feather, something about a feather comes to mind when I'm thinking about it. The naming has something relation to a feather. Apache Before, arrow? What is it? Uh, maybe Apache arrow? Uh, arrow is is one yes um, no there's a it's p quill or or p something uh, it's a it's a different management of, of memory a different storage of memory where I'm going with the topic though is the storage or the optimized methods of storage are different between what a data frame does versus what data table does versus what this p quill p something it is an open source and I think it is an Apache service but between the three there is a method difference in the way the environment stores those services. What we're dealing with right now is just data frame allocation, just data frame management. So Arthur, your question about lists is important. When we are manipulating things, you are going to incur a potential of cost in CPU flopping to get that new memory allocation uh, made. So if I run through this whole for loop or I run through this, this per application map R uh, service, it's going to end up incurring some level of time association. Um, Frederica, if you don't mind me uh, commenting on a couple of weeks ago in the uh, tidy modeling with R book club, there was a particular chapter where if you run the code, it's gonna, you're gonna, take like two hours for, for the uh, machine learning and all the, the different tendencies to take place. The reason that you're incurring such a high cost of time, meaning the CPU just crunch, uh, grinding through all that data, having a supercomputer doesn't really help you much, right? You're going to get a, a very small gain in timing. You're still going to incur a lot of effort to uh, store that memory. So the option of possibly uh, optimizing it would be maybe instead of using data frame, I use data table instead. Does that help? Yeah. Um, Arthur, did I answer your question or I don't want to glaze over? No, no, it. no. I, I, think, I think so. Yeah. Okay. I think we'll probably come back to it with the next chapter as well. Good. Okay. All right. Uh, moving on. The next example that we have here is we're creating a third object. We're, we're, we're uh, allocating another memory location. So this copy on modify to a D3 object, data frame number three object. Here, we're only changing, or sorry, we are going to incur a huge cost because now we're going to be doing a row wise calculation. Uh, what we see here in this line of text says, take the object D3 memory or row number one, uh, and then multiply it by the number three. Well, to incur that, not only are you creating more memory, but then you also have 
to do the calculation as well. So D1 to D3, memory allocation AB3, and then AA1. We can see that the row one, sorry, the X column and the Y columns, numbers one and two, are multiplied by three. So now we get three and six. However, because of that listed memory location, we are also making a copy, changing the location, memory location of those new variable, uh, new lists, new vectors, new, new columns. So by changing values one and two, I have to create a copy for D3 in numbers three, five, and six, six, four, and three. The second and third rows are the same between these two objects, these two named objects. The fact that we modified the rows though incurred an additional cost because we had to reassign them to another memory location if your data uh, data frame is is quite lengthy or very very um, spread out um, this is a lot of churning uh, just to create that new service that new object name uh, talking in character vectors character vectors are slightly different than numeric values R actually uses a global string pool. I found this <laughs> very, very valuable. I thought this was really cool. Um, I have heard about the string pool before, but I've never witnessed it in this uh, format. I thought this was really helpful. Uh, where each element of a character vector is a pointer to a unique string in a pool. Named object X, assign, uh, sorry, binding it to the memory uh, values of vector of A, character A, character A, character ABC, and then character D. We can use that same previous lobster reference uh, for the named object X, and then looking for character T, uh, character is true. Uh, that, that's interesting. So basically the same character is assigned to the same uh, memory location. Mm -hmm. Well, but this starts to really start, uh, it really starts to make sense when you are doing uh, other packages, string R is where I'm going with this thought process, right? These, these more character oriented, natural language processing sort of, of uh, management. So if we, if we think of a PDF, we think of a, a text document, um, you know, these, these various strings, or as we ingest in the data and, and, and create these, these string elements, the memory allocation is going to point at this string, uh, this global string pool, right? So what, what I guess for me personally, when I was reading this particular section, what was mind blowing was like, well, that makes sense why it's so optimal. Now I comprehend the efficiency of some of the tools or natural language processing uh, points, text mining type uh, tidyverse uh, oriented functions, why this is so efficient and uh, being able to search through um, and pull out uh, uh, elements. If you haven't watched any of the string R topics in the R for DS book club, um, I happened to do that chapter. I was I was the presenter. It went over two weeks. Um, or if we reference the text mining or the the uh, machine learning uh, for natural language processing book clubs, uh, if you watch any of those presentations, they are awesome. Um, in this having it in this presentation, this advanced R book club presentation, it all connected with why this is so efficient on, on operation. So this global string pool, we have a string with value A, we have a second string with the value ABC, and we have a second, second string with the value D. Note, note, this uh, particular vector has character A, character A, character ABC, and character D. The only thing unique between those are these three elements. If you notice the second element, the copy of A, uh, the second uh, allocation of A, it's just a pointer at the previous location. I, maybe it's just me, I found this really intriguing. I, I, I really connected with this section. This has implications for how much memory a character vector uses to find out, use the lobster object size uh, to confirm. So for object size X, meaning the named object, uh, we have 248 bits of data. For 
uh, object character D, we have 112 bits. And for the, and I guess this is a combination between the two. Uh, what, uh, there's a note about this. The, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're binding the values of X back to X again, and then, and the value D. So the object size only increments by a very, very small amount. And it's, it's due to that global string pool thought process. And the first one we have 248, uh, 264 is not too much off of that. Okay. Continuing. Um, object underscore size does not, op, uh, does not equate to object dot size. When, che when checking object size in Lobster, um, the object underscore size function will provide a more accurate result. This is, this is commented in the documentation for utilities and then object dot size. It should be reasonably accurate for atomic vectors, but does not detect if elements of a list are shared. So the point is the two functions, one being this lobster package, the other one being base oriented. Uh, between the two of them, they are not doing the same search. They're not, they're not providing you the same information. They do not equal each other. So if we are assign, uh, creating the name object y uh, using the function um, rep, 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 rep. We were using rep earlier. Uh, uh, what is it again? I'm sorry. Yeah, I think it's basically just like repeating. So here you're, you're, you're repeating, repeating the okay. same object and repeating it a hundred times. Uh, we're generating a bunch of output, right? We're just creating a, a huge list, uh, a huge uh, memory of data with this, correct? Exactly. That's or at least that's my understanding. No, you're you're probably accurate. Forgive me. And sometimes I have to stare at the code for a bit to comprehend what exactly it's doing. Um, with object size and then asking for the object Y, we get uh, uh, 80,896 bits. Um, when we do an, a base utility object dot size, we get 800, uh, what is that? Uh, 8 million. Um, 5,648 bits. The point being is these two do not equate to each other. Um, I don't believe it has to do with the operating systems memory or the garbage collector that Frederica, you were asking about. Um, I think this is just looking at two different uh, uh, forms. The function is doing two different things, the, the, the difference between these two. Yeah, yeah. Um... The thing I was interested in was the garbage thing. And I, I think that's going to so, be yeah. if it's so let's do modify in place first. And then we have the, the last slide talking about the garbage collector. Um, I will spend a little bit of time. We are only at, I don't know what our timing is at the moment. Seven minutes. We have seven minutes left. <laughs> okay, let me finish then. Um, modifying in place versus copy on modify. Modifying in place is more related to your environment itself. Uh, modifying in our object usually, usually creates a copy of that in changing. The exceptions are if it is a single binding, as shown earlier, all of the, the topics we were covering in the previous slides, or we bring in this new subject environments. There's going to be an entire chapter dedicated to environments. Um, in my own without reading those chapters in my own thought process of what an environment implies. It is the working arena, working space of when R is running, okay? So you've, you've got this environment and you're manipulating it inside this single environment. It has nothing to do with the outside world. Okay? It doesn't have any global uh, perce uh, perception. Environments are a special type of object, are always modified in place. And the comment, Arthur, if you didn't, um, I know you read the chapter because you're bringing up a, a, a good point earlier. With environments, you can, you can uh, assign it itself and it will do a modify in place. Um, you don't incur this global output of memory allocation. It literally just replaces itself. Um, implications, we can create functions that remember their previous states. So stick with me as I explain. Uh, object named E1 uh, with a base language uh, environment uh, a equals one b equals two c equals three 
and then we reassign, sorry, rebind uh, the object E1 to E2. What we're seeing in our image at the bottom, these two rounded purple pinkish sort of objects, and then their, their uh, memory space uh, 1D9 with values C, B, and A, or A, B, and C. And then their assignments to the numeric values 1, 2, and 3. When we look at the second point here, and we look at just the value of C, uh, and we modify it to 4, it doesn't change its memory allocation. It just changes the value. Okay. So three just becomes this ephemeral space of, of it's out there, we're tracking with it, but it's not being referenced by any of our current named objects. It's not being bound by it's any of our, there. it's there. still there. Well, and, but, but this implication, Frederica, is where the garbage collector thought process comes into play. Okay, so as we modify this and we have this, I don't know, value of three taking up space somewhere, but it's not being used or called upon by, or it's not being bound by any of our named objects. Okay. We have what they call the garbage collector. In most current object-oriented programming formats, the garbage collector is managed by the uh, environment and or by the operating system itself. We don't have to think about it. And even the author, Mr. Wickham or Dr. Wickham, mentions that you shouldn't have to ever worry about the garbage collector unless you implicitly, explicitly state I want to remove all of this uh, temp storage, this, this memory that's no longer there, um, this defragmented format of storage, uh, and then reallocate it back to the operating system. And the, the thought I've always had in this, in this uh, opinion is I think of garbage collectors as like I'm putting a bunch of uh, um, in a recycling bin. Okay, um, I always break down my boxes, my wife does not. So as you put in these, uh, boxes that haven't been collapsed, they just take up a lot of space. And now we have more boxes than will fit in the container. So I go in and I collapse the boxes and I put, uh, I reassign the placement of that um, same matter, same cardboard. It just takes up smaller space. So now I can fit more into it. Um, you're allocating back that storage to your operating system instead. Objects get deleted thanks to the garbage collector, or GC for short. G free frees up memory by deleting our objects that are no longer used. That kind of fragmented, no longer pointed at value of three in the previous slide. I'm going to run the garbage collector and then give it back to um, either another program uh, or to the operating system, etc. GC runs automatically whenever R needs more memory to create an object. So it is implicit implied that you as the author person that is working with the RStudio environment or the R environment, you shouldn't have to really think about this too much. Where it becomes important is when your computer starts to slow down, you are running some very, very uh, heavy intensive programs, you may need to shut down other services to apply that memory to your computer or to this, this uh, running. I don't know if you know, service. sorry if I interrupt you, I don't know if you know this thing, but the, so when I, I make use of uh, many object, objects okay. in R, and they, they are collected in my memory. So it's not that when I uh, shut down the program and restart it back, we'll open it back later, some of them, they go away. They're persistent. They're Okay. Um, so sh but, should I use this uh, uh, garbage collector? You uh, shouldn't. I'll put in the chat. No, uh, you shouldn't have to, Frederica. And okay. and what, where I'm thinking of this is when you terminate your environment, when your when your process ID, okay, this assignment of CPU and and memory to your your process, when it shuts down the garbage collector automatically releases that stored memory or the allocation of that stored memory back to whatever other additional service requires it. So what I'm talking about here, team, is non-persistent memory. When I use the term cache, that's usually often very close to your CPU, your random access memory, your RAM, right? Some people always claim that, oh, I've got you know 16 gigs of RAM, 32 gigs of RAM, 96 gigs of RAM. It doesn't really matter. It's just the amount of access to this memory storage 
uh, this garbage collector thought process, I can open more programs, right? It doesn't mean that your computer is any more efficient. It just says I have more access, so I don't really have to think about incurring the cost of garbage collection at the end. My point being to Frederica, when you close your program, your process ID should also terminate, meaning that it relinquishes that previous stored non-persistent memory back to uh, your, uh, your uh, other programs, other um, environmental, um, environment's not the right word. I'm thinking of like the top command, if anybody ever runs the top command on a, on a Linux or MacBook, you're getting a uh, process ID value and then how much memory it's currently operating with. So by closing the program, you're giving that uh, resource back to uh, another service that can use it. And I'm not using the right word, I'm sorry. There's a, there's a thought I'm having with that management of process IDs, uh, your system D or something to that effect of, of how those uh, are generated. Yeah. If we uh, have a, a quick look at the documentation yeah. for the function, if you go to R and that just like question mark VC. Oh, you want me to open up the session real quick? Sorry, get back to there again. Uh, there we go. No, just uh, a minute that we are we reached the top of the hour, but yeah, I'm sorry. Yes, to have a look at this thing. Yeah, you, you can see, okay, here there's, there's a little of, of, a bit of explanation, but at the bottom of this help page, if you okay. scroll uh, down to the end, you see that it says you can do, do it now. So you can do this and you see if you do in your machine, just, you, you see, what is the output? Uh, was it true? Yeah, you need to do that true and then uh, G, no. Uh, GC. Okay. That, yeah. So this is our, our memory location and then virtual virtual memory. Yeah. So uh, then so it goes forward to the last uh, uh, bit of this chunk of code which says reset equals true so it seems like you can do that safely I, it would be similar to you going in and restarting r uh if you oh, okay. Uh, okay. well the, the the same action takes place so at the top of the list if we go to tools uh no where's that session uh turn uh sorry restart r what we're doing in the command of restart R, and this is at a very low level of your of your uh, service, the, the R language uh, service, the R command. When you're asking it to restart R, it's a request to the computer's operating system. I'm terminating this process ID. I'm requesting a new process ID. And if you were to have a side-by-side -side comparison in your uh, running services. If you're on Windows, it would be Task Manager. If you're in Linux or Mac, it would be this top command I'm referring to. If you were to if you were to restart this and then note the numeric value of process ID will change. It's called the PID. Um, a lot of users will also refer to it that way too. But it's a it's a it's a it's a container or a named object that points at memory allocation for that particular process. Okay. I did run that command, Frederica, the, the GC, and when we had this yeah. N cells and V cells, um, it did tell me that I recovered some level of memory uh, within my R environment. Um, I would need yeah. to run some lobster to, to comprehend what exactly yeah. I have stored. I don't have anything in my environment at the moment, so. But. Yeah, that, that, that's because you, you did uh, GC info true uh, before then GC. Oh, I see. Okay. So it gives you a little bit more information. Uh, Verbose output. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know if you. Uh, um, I'll stop sharing. Are we up to the chapter? Yeah. Uh, we are. That that last <laughs> slide, the garbage collector piece, was the last part of the chapter, and we can expand on it further um, in Slack, or if we want to uh, bring the topic back up next week as well thank you very much ryan great presentation awesome lifesaver <laughs>
So who else would like to be a presenter next week? If there's anyone, so you can pick up a presentation, past presentation, tell whatever, open up the book pages, uh, whatever you like, really. Just we share understanding of the chapter together through a discussion. Does if you don't anyone... mind, Fred yeah? Frederica, that, that was a topic last week. I think it was Arthur or maybe Lucas. Uh, there was a comment about generating your slide deck and the the reference back yeah. to that answer is whatever you feel confident in whatever you feel comfortable with if that's google slides powerpoint our studio our markdown <laughs> the actual book if you just want to open the book and present um the exercise of that output it's whatever you're confident and comfortable with yeah yeah okay so um, as you'll see in slack the, there's a google um form to to put down your name so that would be very helpful so we can talk to each other about the third chapter okay yeah perfect okay so um see you next week i hope to see your name down as a presenter all right okay Thank you very, mu very much, Ryan, and see you next week. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Great presentation, Ryan. Thank you. I appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.